Nils Lofgren has played for Bruce Springsteen, Neil Young's Crazy Horse and Ringo Starr's All-Star Band and over the course of 55 years has had a fantastic solo career himself. Nils has influenced and inspired so many musicians across the years and it was a true honour to speak to him about his latest album Mountains, his recently released collection of unreleased projects called Spares, his virtual rockality series and his ongoing global stadium tour as part of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. Hello and welcome back to Radio Caroline. Josh Holmes Bright here today and I'm joined by a very special guest or two very special guests actually. Um, it's uh, Nils Lofgren. How are you doing Nils? Hope you're, hope you're doing I'm okay. good Josh. Good to see you this morning. Good yeah thank you. Thank you very much for being here and as you say it's the morning for you. It's two o'clock in the afternoon for me but um, you're you're up bright and early this morning aren't you? Yeah it's 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 strange you know when I'm on the road after shows I, I can't sleep for hours and hours. I'm so wound up. And then when I get home, I, I get up really early, sometimes in the dark, we'll watch the sun come up and hang out with my, my dogs and uh, just kind of enjoy a quiet moment before the world wakes up. So happy, yeah. to, happy to talk to you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, and it is great to be able to talk to you, especially off the back of your most recent album, Mountains, which came out in the summer. Um, it's a great album. We featured all the singles here at Radio Caroline. I've, I've listened to the album enough times you know I couldn't count it and um, when did the whole process for it begin was this something that kind of came around after lockdown after COVID when you were kind of allowed back into the recording studios or or when did this all start yeah it was a uh, anyway anyone watching forgive me my camera zooms in and out on me and I don't know why I didn't ask it to I prefer to stay out <laughs> but nice. uh bear with me um it was interesting you know COVID scared the hell out of us especially before the vaccine um, I've been on the road 55 years this last September, and this was the first time I ha I didn't work for three years on the road. It was just not safe in the little clubs I play. So, um, you know, I was I love being home with Amy um, and the dogs, and I just I'm kind of like the the houseboy helping out, running errands, taking out the trash. I mean, Amy runs the place. She's an incredible professional cook and has great. You know, she's a designer and wow. puts my album covers together with me. But after uh, a couple of years, I mean, I found myself going out to my just a home garage studio, primitive, but good. And uh, I put on I just get a good guitar sound and put on Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, um, mostly B.B. King and Albert King. And I just jam along kind of like karaoke blues. And mm, yeah. uh, after after months of that. I just felt like, man, you know, I got to do something professionally. And, I, and I, I'm used to riding on the road, getting my ideas together. Because, you know, when you're on tour, I mean, you call home, make sure everyone's okay. But you can't really be there to help. So you have some time to yourself outside of the shows and preparing for them. So anyway, I thought, you know what? Just challenge yourself to write a record. And whatever it is, share it. Don't write, you know, 30 songs and agonize over what are, do you have an album? Just write an album and share it. And that's how Mountains started. In fact, early on, I, I decided to call it Mountains just because I felt like, uh, you know, my early 70s, I was shocked at all the um, challenges that I was feeling and mountains to climb, if you will, more emotionally, spiritually right. and physically. Yeah. Just, you know, getting older with various health things. And uh, after the 60s, which you had the Vietnam draft, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, I was living in Bethesda, Maryland. And, of course, uh, the Russian ships were 90 miles off of Cuba, and they promised to aim the missiles at me in yeah. D.C. And, you know, with my dad watching TV and all the uh, turmoil and the civil rights marches, Grin played down at some of them in Washington, D.C., and we were happy to. Um, I just thought that kind of humanity was improving, and I was wrong. And so I just felt there were a lot of new mountains to climb, and I'd write a record, whatever came out, and share it. And that led to mountains. Did it here at home? 
course, I had some great friends contribute from other parts, thanks to technology. Uh, and it came out better than I thought. So it's, I a, it's a great record. Yeah, you should be proud yeah. of that one. Yeah, I feel good about it. I'd already decided, hey, whatever it is, share it. And yeah. uh, so I feel really good about it and glad people are enjoying yeah. it. Good. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned your wife, Amy, there as well. Um, she was the inspiration for one of the tracks, right? Nothing's Easy was was for her. Is that right? Yeah. You know, that was one morning, um, again, very early. You can't you can't beg on, on TV <laughs> with you. She wants to get on the radio as well. <laughs> TV, radio, we got it all going on. Here, look. See this? Um, yeah, you know, Amy just... I was after my second divorce, I was I decided that my um, life on the road and in and out of studios, which was really all I did, road or studio uh, for the longest time. And I decided, you know, I just need to be alone. So I kind of went into a relationship retirement. And, um, you know, Amy and I had met at the Stone Pony when we were both very young. And then um, 28 years ago, 15 years later, we met a second time at a bar, the Rockin' Horse here in Arizona. And very long, cool story short. Uh, thankfully, I didn't let her leave without getting her phone number. Uh, we, we talked every day for hours. And at the end of that tour run, about five weeks, I came here to Arizona to meet her and her son, Dylan. Um, and uh, we've been together ever since. So she was a, you know, she really is in, you know she loves music which is you know a must and a great for me and yeah. when i started asking her about music worried that you know it might be someone who didn't enjoy it as much as i did she instantly recited the entire lyric wow. to in your eyes by peter gabriel oh wow, so that, wow. yeah that was kind of extraordinary and um anyway yeah that that song's about here also there's another one i mean it's it's a love song for anybody to anyone uh, could be a uh, you know, I mean, only your smile. It's a kind of American songbook, Nat King Cole type song hmm. that uh, the yeah. great Ron Carter, upright bassist extraordinary, was kind enough to play on. So yeah, there are a lot of nice touches, and of course the uh, the autobiographical story of that meeting, and then 15 years between the first and second date is also another song. The great David Crosby, rest his soul, Cros, love you. Mm. Uh, he's sitting on too. And, um, you know, God, what was that song's name? Damn. <laughs> Do you have, you know, what, where, where's my record? Hold it's on all right. Oh, you've got it. Oh, that's got all right. it. Perfect. I can't be that senile. No, that's all right. 55 years on the road. Uh, I'd be impressed if you could remember all of the records. I didn't find it, but I remember the song. I, I, rem I, re I remember her name was right. like an autobiographical tale of Amy and I's saga with 15 years between the first two meetings and uh, David Crosby was saying beautifully on it. And it's just uh, a lot of the songs, are, it was just kind of autobiographical or just dealing with this unexpected amount of trauma from the world and the planet and the human race that I thought we were headed through and by, and I was mistaken. Wow. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Lots of emotion behind, behind the tracks. And um, were, were all of the songs written from something kind of close to you in your life? Was this all a, a kind of personal biographical album? Well, I wouldn't call it all autobiographical, but you know, as a writer, I mean, I have a great imagination. I make up storylines, but even the characters, uh, the emotions are autobiographical, yeah. but of course, I don't want to be limited to my life only, even though it's been fairly colorful. Um, I like to imagine different scenarios and different characters. And, you know, look, we're, we're all human beings. So, you know, between love, hate, fear, kindness, I mean, it kind of covers it all. And we all go through it uh, our entire lives. And um, so I just really felt good about it. And uh, when, when it was done, I you know I didn't question sharing it, but I, I felt better about it than I thought I would. It's been fairly well received, but mainly it was something to do besides, you know, playing karaoke blues guitar to BB King, yeah, and Albert, and Muddy Waters, and Howlin' Wolf, who I think are 
probably the greatest. And uh, I got to see a lot of those guys in the 60s, which was a blessing. In little tiny clubs, I saw B.B. King many, many times. Got to see Muddy Waters once, two shows in one night. And snuck wow. into the dressing room at the uh, cellar door. Uh, famous, pl- famous little club that was incredible. Cast of uh, musical characters came through. That's where I went, met Neil Young and Crazy Horse. And I was just hanging in the corridor. They were playing cards and, you know, just really into this card game, Muddy and his band. And he saw me in the corner and, you know, he was staring at me. I said, Mr. Waters, I bought tickets to both shows. I'm sorry. Could I just stand here and watch you play cards? And he kind of smiled and said, OK, kid. They went back to playing cards and ignoring me. But, you know, all that music lives on. But to get to see some of these acts in person in little places just was a huge imprint. You know, of course, Hendrix, I saw many times, yeah. took trains all over the East Coast. So anyway, I was blessed to come up in an era where there was no video, there was no internet. Uh, even if it was just teen clubs, that little bands I was in played, you had to learn how to play in front of people. You know, that was the hobby, that was the game. And then all of a sudden, after seeing Jimi Hendrix, I kind of was possessed with the idea of trying it professionally. And here I am 55 years later. Yeah, that's, it's worked out quite well. It has to be said, it's worked out quite well. Um, now, before we move on from the album, one last thing I've got to say. I mean, you mentioned Neil Young there, who uh, who featured on the album, but Ringo Starr as well. I mean, um, uh, you know, imagine being part of a post-Beatles world. Anyone, any musician is going to be at least somewhat inspired by the Beatles. So how do you go around asking one of these these legends, maybe heroes, um, to, to play on your new record? Yeah, Go ahead, the dog door is open, Rose. Here, look. look. Yeah, you know, I I do think the Beatles had the greatest body of recorded music in history. Uh, I was playing classical accordion from age five and somewhere around 11 or 12, 13, the Beatles came out and my world exploded. And really through the Beatles and Stones, it was through them I discovered Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Little Richard, Stax Vault, Motown, all of it. Yeah. So yeah. it was um, on the Born USA tour, my first tour with the East Street Band, playing Wembley. Uh, Max Weinberg, our incredible drummer, had written a book called The Big Beat about drummers. And I was friends with all of them, including Ringo. And Ringo invited us to a birthday party uh, late night. And there was a jam room. And I thought, I, I I, they're going to have to throw me out because I'm not leaving until I get to play with Ringo. I got to play with him. We sat up late talking, having some drinks. And he was such a sweet guy. And of course, as, as much of a hero, musical hero as I could ever have a conversation with. And then he gave me his phone number and said, stay in touch. So I started calling every few weeks. We both lived in L.A. And uh, one thing led to another. Four years later in 89, he... Uh, called and you know it's, he's talked about it like hey you can't follow the Beatles you know that's the best band in history yeah uh, but he felt like you know he was he was you know more famous than you probably want to be had all the money he needed and he wasn't feeling right because he wasn't drumming and he had to figure out a way to do that thus the all-star band I was honored he wanted me to be in the first one I was in the second too and uh, I was in a rental house in L.A. and said, yeah, we're going to all sing two or three of our own songs. We're going to take turns like a round robin. And I'm uh, getting my favorite players in this band. And uh, and I was just so honored and blown away. And of course, OK, it's going to be four months. Here's rehearsals. Pick your songs. And I went to say goodbye. <coughs> and he said, wait a minute. Don't you want to know who's in the band? And I said, well, you're in the band. Said, yeah, I'm the band leader. I said, well, that's all I need to know. And it was funny because he laughed and said, well, let me tell you anyway. It's you and Joe Walsh on guitars, Dr. John on piano, Billy Preston on organ, your wow. buddy Claire Clemens on sax, Rick Danko on bass, and Levon Helm from the band. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. That's not that's bad. That's the band I can perform us. <laughs> so anyway, I've been very blessed and uh we we've stayed in touch and um i consider him you know as great a musician drummer bandmate as there's ever been and uh i had this track you know he during before code i was saying i'll make another record he said well look uh, i'm happy to play on a track for you of course i wanted to go to la and play live in person which kevin mccormick 
incredible friend, bass player, and producer did on the Silver Lining album. We recorded a song called Walkin' Nerve. And it was me, Ringo, and Kevin in the room, no baffles, tracking live, just like the old days. So I wanted to do that, but with COVID, it was really, you know, even Ringo said, well, you know, why do you want to do that? Get a studio, spend all this money. You know, we all got a test. And so why don't you just color out the track where you like it and send it to me and I'll play on it. He's really good at that. So I sent him this track, Ain't the Truth Enough. And, um, you know, I, as a courtesy, wanted to see if he'd like it or not. And he called the next day and he was singing the chorus, Ain't the Truth Enough. So I thought that was a good sign. And sure yeah. enough, <clears throat> we sent it to him and he played his ass off. First track. And again, just kind of an inspired idea. I had this great open G riff. Da, 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 with an open G tuning on a old uh, D35 that Jimmy Kahn, the great actor, had give, given to me in L.A. And it just, it went like that. A lot of people just, you know, heard the song, said, yeah, send it, I'll sing on it or I'll play on it. And I was very grateful to have that help. But got a good video of that, too, if anyone wants to look it up, Ain't the Truth Enough. And it's the live track of Ringo playing. He was kind enough to... Um, his um, his friend filmed it all and sent us the live video to use in our homegrown video of that track. So I was very blessed to have yeah. help like that. And yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I I can't even believe, you know, when I was a kid, even, you know, playing in the teen clubs, nobody thought where I grew up in Maryland, uh, nobody uh, right outside of Washington, D.C., nobody thought you could do that for a living. And after seeing Jimi Hendrix live the first time, I saw mm. him many times, I was possessed with the idea to try it. A few years later, my band Grin opened three shows for Jimi Hendrix Experience in, in California. One was on my 19th birthday. And, wow. Uh, it, it just, you know, it was we, we were just blown away that we were opening for Jimi Hendrix. It was us, Ball and Jack, and Jimi Hendrix. So, um, you know, afterwards, David Briggs, Neil Young's producer, Rest His Soul, and Grin's producer, my my first few solo albums, one of my my greatest mentor, Neil Young and David Briggs. Uh, David said, "No, it's your birthday. Why don't you go knock on the trailer door and say hi to Jimi Hendrix?" And though I couldn't do that, but of course David, like a big brother, kind of bullied me into it. Right. And uh, at some point with David, you just go along with it, or you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> And I, I knock on the door, Jimmy answered. I got to talk to him, say, hey, you're the reason I'm doing this. I'm your opening act. I, I owe all this to you. Um, and I, I can't thank you enough. And I'm so honored. And before I made the rookie mistake of inviting myself in for a guitar lesson, I realized, okay, that's enough. Thanks, Jimmy. Love you. And, you know, kind of closed the door. And he, he was grinning and waved. He was very cool about it. And, you know, I was blessed to get to see him open for him, but mainly just see him live a lot, which imprinted me deeply in so many ways as a performer and a guitarist. He was, he was my favorite. I mean, there's some extraordinary ones, you know, Jeff Beck's right up there. I can still cannot believe we just lost Jeff Beck. Yeah. I thought those two were kind of off in their own, but uh, you know, as far as imprints, you, you know, really it was Jimmy and I mean, Roy Buchanan and Jeff Beck for all the league stuff. And there's so many great ones, but those are my top ones. And of course, Keith Richards uh, with the whole rhythm. Every time he plays rhythm, he's writing a theme. And uh, I think Jimmy and Keith were probably my two you know, most famous guitarists who imprinted me. Yeah. Uh, with very different approaches, but still just this soul, soul rock and roll that's uh, stayed with me and, and everybody through all these yeah. decades. They're, they're legends yeah and they've been as you say inspired so many and um, that's kind of answered one of my next questions actually which was kind of to do with some of your your early musical memories because you've got a new series up on on your website called rockality um you're kind of on the spot which is impressive on the spot telling stories from um the 55 years on the road and and the start of this career so and um, what what gave you the urge to get these stories out there in this form because obviously so many people have done autobiographies and that kind of thing you've done it as a, a virtual series if you like so tell yeah, us about that. you know josh people have asked me to write books for a long time my heart's not in writing a book you know walking in south side of chicago where i was born walking through three feet of snow to louis pasture elementary school i'm not i'm not interested in sharing all that stuff but i've told stories from the musical side for decades. And people in general seem to really enjoy the stories. 
And yeah. I thought, well, why don't I just, um, you know, why don't I just tell them and, you know, tell a story for 20 minutes, 25 minutes and sing a song or do a jam. Yeah. So I've started that series at, at millsockman.com. You can find it, Rockality, the great Ralph Stedman, uh, Hunter Thompson's artist and dear friend did the uh, cover art for me. And I've got six now, I think, posted, and I, I want to start doing more as I'm on the road. And hopefully people enjoy them because um, it's just focused on the musical adventures, not so much a biography of everything and anything that went on with my life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're great. I've seen most of the six episodes up there. I need to watch the last two, I think. But um, yeah, episodes one through till six uh, available at nilslofgren.com. Um, but as cool as that is, getting to hear all of these stories and some of the ones you've told in the, the 20 minutes we've had already have been incredible. But uh, almost as cool as that, if not cooler, is this new album you've got coming out uh, announced just a couple of days ago called Spares, which is kind of all of these tracks you've you've rediscovered, is it, that from across the 55 years that haven't been released yet? Yeah, you know, Josh, these these are songs. There's a there's a lot of songs that are almost finished on the way to being finished primitive demos but there's some of them that are, are complete songs that are demoed up in some fashion that i always felt connected to mm. and you know they just never made it to a record or they i forgot about them or they got away and they start building up like you know they're different from ideas there's a lot of songs are like oh you know i'm <clears throat> this is a, a demo from 30 years ago and i'm missing a chorus i'm going to steal this song's hook and or the bridge and make it a chorus for this song kind of borrowing from yourself yeah um but these are complete songs sometimes very primitive recordings that i still feel close to and i felt like after all these years that's not going to go away and what am i waiting for you know it's it's just share them you know we're try keeping a i think it's you know nine bucks or something we're trying to make it very reasonable just to share stuff that i'm attached to that i never did share and not make a big deal about it but get them out there and uh Greg Lucas, is a great friend and mastering engineer in Virginia who mastered my records, did a great job of putting them all together. And I love listening to him because now it's not like, oh, maybe someday I should re-record it, share it, do something with it because they're complete. You know, they feel like complete songs to me. So that's coming out, I think, March 8th, uh, just on download, you know, not some formal album release. And there's 31 of them, a lot of music all over the place. Um, and I, I feel great about it. And it's just kind of a good house cleaning of things that are still important to me. And I yeah. figure if they're important now, after all these years, <laughs> I shouldn't wait till they're not important. I should just share them with people. Absolutely. Yeah. So March 8th, by the time this this goes out, the album spares will be available um, and on, on the digital platforms as well. But well, um, the 31 <clears throat> songs, you said 31 songs across 55 years. I imagine it was quite emotional to to kind of go go through your career and your your memories did it bring up quite a lot of emotion and, and memories yeah yeah it did and it also you know reminds you the, those times when look music i think is the planet's sacred weapon it's the greatest gift we have billions of people a day turn to music to heal and unite Absolutely. billions so i look back and you know like of course when when you're younger i mean there's i had no life but music and, you know, you get an idea, you run to the, you know, Bob Dawson's local studio, a friend of mine in Virginia, Bias Studios, where I did a lot of recording uh, with David Briggs. And even Neil Young did a, a bonus track of Keith Don't Go with Grin, with Neil Young playing piano and singing that's on my box set. Okay. Um, that's really, really my favorite version of Keith Don't Go. But um, it just reminded me of the, the dedication and how deeply in I was to every phase of my musical life. Um, and a lot of it was when I had no other life. You know, I didn't have, you know, this great wife and dogs and all that. I just had the road, the gigs, the bars and the studios. England and UK was so beautiful because after the Tonight's the Night tour with Neil Young in 73, I think, uh, one of the promoters, of course, with Neil Young, a lot of people are around. You meet people and talk to them and, a uh, great story once, um, you know, the Pretenders. I, I went to their first tour and wound up meeting them, befriending them. We're still friends, you know. It was, was at Jimmy's funeral. Jimmy J James Honeyman Scott broke our hearts. And then a year later, we lost Pete Farnan. Uh, and they're still out killing it and doing it, you know. Extraordinary, extraordinary band. 
Yeah. But, um, you know, just uh, after one of the gigs, Neil said, I think we were playing in London, <clears throat> maybe the Rainbow Room. I don't know. Um, and Neil, out of the blue, said, you know what? Take take the least equipment we need for everyone to have an instrument and let's do a midnight jam at the Speakeasy, uh, a famous bar nightclub in London. And right. I was like, wow. We're going to go play. And so we're, we're sitting there, you know, everyone's drinking and, you know, getting a buzz on. But we're going to play at midnight or later. And um, this girl walks up and big Neil Young fan. We talk, we have a conversation and, uh, you know, it was just cool. I was, you know, I was drinking a, quite a bit and kind of had forgotten about it. And years later, Chrissy Hine reminds me it was her right. before she got pretenders together. She had come up and asked me some questions, huge Neil Young fan. And I was like nervous. I said, oh God, Chrissy, I hope I wasn't a jerk. He said, no, you were <laughs> you were friendly and nice. And, uh, but you know, just beautiful things. You know, if you love music, which everyone does, you don't have to play it to get that healing hit every day. And uh, Amy and I flew to LA years ago when uh, Neil was playing and Chrissy was opening. I'll never forget, she walked out on the stage and just said, you know, she was so honored to open for neil young she got down on the floor and kissed it wow wow just, just uh you know let us know how much she loved neil and to be there and you know that that kind of spirit lives in all of us you don't have to play music i often tell people too i've got a, a guitar school a beginner's school my website of lessons and, and an intermediate school and i t people are always like um oh, i i love to play but i can't because i have no rhythm or talent and I said, well, do you love music? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I said, well, don't let anyone tell you you need any of that. All you need is a love of music. Go get a teacher. Learn how to play. And that's kind of what my beginning lessons are at my website. Just say, hey, here's some simple things. Mainly lead you to the blues because the blues are the universal language. And it's only two notes a string. You can be playing the blues right away and feeling what music feels like when you're playing, making music. So I use the blues as a template to kind of get people involved and enjoying it immediately, not like take 30 lessons and you'll start having fun. No, you should have fun now. Yeah. And that's the theme of the guitar school. But I've been lucky, you know, to, to be in all these circumstances, all these bands. And I love being in a band with a gig tonight more than anything of what I do. And I've been blessed to be in many great ones. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that kind of brings me on to my, my final question, really, we've kind of gone through through looking back and, and what you've rediscovered to, to today. Um, and you're hit, hit, hitting the road uh, very, very soon um, again with with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band um, finishing off the dates you have for America that were postponed last year and coming back over here to Europe um, to hit more more of the biggest stadiums and arenas that we've got. It's quite incredible. So, um, I mean, you say you prefer playing in a band. That was part of the question. But um, the audiences as well, um, is it still... I mean, how, what does it mean to you all these years later to still be playing to, to audiences this big that still love you just as much, if not more, than, than they have? Well, I, I will say, I, I'll say a couple of things. First, it's, it's, a, it's a musical heaven I could have never imagined after 55 years on the road, ever, that I would be this blessed. Also, I will say, you know, we until COVID, Amy and I would come over almost every year for four or five weeks travel around the UK in a bus. Uh, we love that because there are towns you could go town to town and <clears throat> try to play five or six cities a week in these beautiful theaters. England has these theaters. There's some theaters six, 700 years old that only are 400 seats with all the levels and the balconies. And, you know, we were just so amazed that you'd show up in this little town. They had a beautiful little theater and people would come see and, and a lot of times i do acoustic duo me and greg barlotta a buddy of mine and afterwards we'd go out and sign anything you know of course we'd like to sign a new album or a cd of mine but i'll sign a ticket from anything uh, and just chat with people and get feedback on the gig and we love that so much and of course that went away with covid yeah. and we hope someday to do that again but what's happened is now that i have this beautiful you know, wife, home, dogs. My son Dylan's down the road 28 years with Amy. Um, I have a, a fuller life and I love that. But when I go to play now, uh, I, I don't like leaving home. But 
walking out on stage with a great band, I have more gratitude, joy, and excitement than I've ever had. And I think part of it might be like, why the hell am I away from home? Because you have this gift. So what are you going to do with it? So it focuses me. I mean, I, I love show days, you know, days off. I'm a little like lost because <laughs> I'm away from home. But show days, okay, today you got to go to the gym, work on this little ache and pain, got to get something good to eat, but not too much, blah, blah, blah. Let's go to the gig early and practice these songs or work on, you know, one of your big solos. I mean, I, I'm just as ha- literally just as happy playing rhythm guitar. That might be my favorite thing to do with Bruce, but I'm happy to do it all. And it's just a, a joy and a gratitude I found more than ever after 55 years, which, of course, is a great blessing. Uh, there's some kind of healing hit you get as a performer that after about 15 years on the road, if you're not getting that, you get off the road. You, right. know, you might find something else to do at home musically, but living on the road is not for everybody. And it's that healing hit, being in a great band, walking in front of an audience. And incidentally, my last band tour just before COVID was with a call called the weather band, Andy Newmark on drums, Kevin McCormick bass, the great Cindy Mizell singing my brother, Tommy Laughlin, favorite swing man I've ever worked with. And, you know, best friend, I uh, love all my three brothers. And we toured for five, six weeks, put out a live record. And uh, it just being on, being on the road with the band, of course, we're staying in the, the, you know, the cheaper hotels. It's fine. The the main thing is you got a gig tonight. People yeah. are coming. Don't matter if it's 400 or 40,000. Got a babysitter, dog sitter, parking. It's a hassle. So you know they're coming to hear you play and they're rooting for you. You know, they're rooting for you. It's kind of like with, you know, you walk out in these giant stadiums with Bruce or Neil Young or Ringo or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I really feel like... Um, I, I played a lot of sports growing up, played a lot of soccer, you know, played American football, of course, basketball. And I equate it to um, like with Bruce, for instance, playing Wembley Stadium, or I don't even know where we're playing in London, but we're doing two shows there. But you're coming you to Wembley. Like yeah, we are. So you feel like you're playing a Super Bowl or like a World Cup. You know, you feel like that, except the audience, the, the, half the crowd isn't rooting against you and for the other team. They're all rooting for you. Yeah. And even better, you're guaranteed, he, every town feels like a hometown crowd. You right. know, I feel like you're in a hometown. That's the magic of what the music turns this town you're in into. And better yet, you're guaranteed a victory. You're just working on the point spread. I mean, it's crazy, you know, because I know athletes, I love athletics and you know, every every game, I played a lot of sports. Yeah, you lose. You get used to it. I have another chance to win tomorrow. With a great band touring, there's no lose. You're just working on how good it can be. And yeah, some nights you get like, damn, man, I got to go practice these songs. And I was sloppy. But, but you understand and learn that if your heart's in it, and mine is. That That's there's fantastic. No, you, you, you're always going to win. It's just a question of how great you can make the night for the audience and the energy they give us, the energy they give us that we feed off of them does create a bit of healing. Uh, and I just don't even, it's not even part of my psyche that, Hey, they're paying a lot of money. You're getting judged. You want them to come back. Of course. But I don't think like that. Cause when you're in a great band, you know, they're rooting for you and it's going to be a great night, no matter what you're just working on how great you can make it. So I do feel blessed to feel that way about playing live. And, uh, you know, we go through it. Amy says goodbye. She takes care of everything. I call every day, but she knows how much I love playing live. She's watched me do it for almost 30 years. That's great that you still love it as much. It's really fantastic. Now, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't even know how to how to say goodbye because I don't want to because the stories have been so incredible. But um, thank you so much for for giving up your time. It, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to chat to you, Neil. So yeah, thank you. Gosh, th- thanks for you know I, what I do is very grassroots. I appreciate you spreading the word on my various projects. And uh, God willing, I mean, of course, I'll be over there with East Street Band, hmm. and uh, someday I want to get over there and tour those beautiful little clubs and theaters of the UK and go town to town with Amy selling the merch and coming out and signing and meeting the people. I, 
I hope Please that's do. in my future too. So God bless you all and all the listeners on Radio Caroline doing a great thing. All the best. Thank you so much. I'll see you over here soon. Cheers, Josh. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day.